How's everyone doing this evening? Why don't we all stand for worship? Of sin and shame, and you cover me with grace. You mend my life with your holy fire. You cover me with grace. You are the hand that reaches out to save. I am set free. Oh. I am set free, oh, 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 it is for freedom that I am set free. You broke my chains of sin and shame and you covered me with grace. With the holy fire, you cover me with grace. You are the hand that reaches out to save. I am set free, oh, I am set free, oh, it is for freedom that I. set free oh, oh, oh I am set free oh, oh, oh it is for freedom that I am set free yes Lord we are grateful for your grace i 
was all around But the Spirit of the Lord is here Overflow in this place Fill our hearts with your love Your love surrounds us You're the reason we came to
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your name, Lord God. Just thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Just thank you so much so we can worship you tonight. We are so undeserving of everything that you give to us. Just continue to bless us, Lord God, as we worship you.
Father, I thank you for this night, God. Uh, I thank you that we're allowed to worship you and that you've given us that precious gift of salvation. Lord, I pray that you would just bless this night and open our hearts, Lord, to hear what you have to say. And I pray that you would just let every distraction be melted away with the death of our sins, God. Lord, I pray that you would just allow us to receive you, God, in every capacity, Lord. Um, and that you would just bless this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Let's turn in those Bibles to Exodus chapter 23 as we continue our journey through God's Word. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift up this night to you, God. We thank you for the beautiful worship, Lord. We just thank you for allowing us to, to bow before you, that you would open your throne room up to us, Lord, your creation. Allow us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we're thankful for this place that you've given us to gather here tonight, for the fellowship of the saints, Lord, that we may fellowship with you tonight. God, we're thankful for your word, and we just ask for a mighty anointing upon your word tonight, that you would speak to us, God, that you would open up our hearts, that you would meet us here, Lord, that you would anoint and bless our time. We offer ourselves and our time to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Exodus chapter 23. Back in chapter 20, God had given unto Moses the Ten Commandments, and then in, uh, through Moses in chapters 21 and 22, God expounded and broke down for the people how these commandments are to apply to the various aspects of, of human life, which then set the standard uh, for specifically how the judges in Israel were to uh, judge between right and wrong. So God set the moral boundaries that dealt with things like we saw dealing with servanthood or uh, what we would call relationships in the workplace. He dealt with violence and how we are to be uh, personally responsible for the harm that we might bring unto others. He gave us the moral guidelines in regards to how we should treat our parents. He dealt with stealing and irresponsible, negligent behavior, uh, honesty, self-defense, sexual purity, idol worship, lending money or banking practices. Uh, He warned against taking advantage of the widows and the orphans or the poor. Uh, He dealt with how we are to respect and obey 
uh, the leadership and our government. He dealt with tithing. Each time, laying out the consequences for Israel in not obeying these laws and statutes that God has established. Now, the purpose of the law is good. People think, why, why is God so strict? Well, God knows man. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And God's going to raise up a, a, a nation here and a culture here in Israel that's going to bring forth the Messiah. And for any culture to, uh, to thrive or grow, there has to be boundaries and regulations for that culture. Without boundaries and laws, people would not survive. And, and thus it's, it's the love of God for man that moved him to establish parameters that would then protect, it would, it would protect man from himself. And so it was important that God established his law in his people and equally as important for his people uh, to obey God's law and to respect God's law through obedience. And it's and it's it's simply for the the the, the preservation of 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 man. It's for the perseverance of mankind as a whole. And then Moses is going to continue in chapter twenty three, verse one. He says, "You shall not circulate a false support, report." As he's continuing, uh, sort of breaking down the law here. Then the the ninth commandment says, "You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor," meaning you shall not be the instigator of a falsehood. But here it's presented in a much broader perspective and and it relays to us that if you know something is untrue and for whatever reason you don't set the record straight or someone is coming to you with a falsehood that you know is false and you just remain neutral uh, in the whole thing, then you are just as guilty as the one who perpetrated the falsehood because you you are continuing to let it circulate. You're allowing it to continue to circulate. And listen, God hates gossip because God is a God of justice. And gossip in many ways creates injustice because it convicts and tears down another person without giving them the opportunity to defend themselves. He says, do not put your hand with the wicked or do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. In other words, don't be a part of a conspiracy to deceive. And this is in the context of a courtroom or a, a legal proceeding. And what he's saying here is, is, is to condemn an innocent person for personal gain is going to make you the one who is guilty before God. Verse 2, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Anybody under 18, underline that in your Bible. <laughs> It, you know, I'm kidding, but it's always been in the nature of man to, to follow a crowd to do evil. There is an intrinsic draw or pull that begins in us about the time that we reach, you know, adolescent age, where we call it peer pressure, but for whatever reason, we develop this very strong urge to just want to be like everyone else to do what everyone else is doing, to not stand out or to not give the appearance that we are anything but normal. We're just like everybody else. And so we just follow after the crowd. The problem with that is most of of the crowd is lost and heading straight for hell. That's why Jesus warns in Matthew 7, 13, he says, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction there and there are many who go in by it. It's, it's like sheep being led to the slaughter or, or cattle. They don't even know what they're heading for. And if you're a herdsman, all you got to do is get one or two sheep or one or two cattle heading in, in a certain direction and the rest of them will just fall in behind them and they'll follow along. But God here says, my people are to move in the opposite direction of the crowd. My people are to move in the opposite direction of the world. You have to swim upstream. You have to be different. You have to stand out. 
You have to be willing to be part of the minority or even go it alone sometimes. You have to be willing to be unpopular or uncool. You have to be willing to enter through the narrow gate because it's, it's only the narrow gate that leads to life. And unfortunately, the Bible says there are few who find that narrow gate and are willing to enter through it. Why? Because it's the most difficult gate. It's the most difficult path. Choosing the narrow gate, that road, is what causes the crowd to make fun of you, to call you strange or peculiar or different. But really, if you could translate what they were saying, if you could hear what they were saying to you when they say all these things, if you could hear it from heaven's perspective, this is what it would sound like. Why are you walking toward life? Why aren't you heading toward death and destruction just like the rest of us? What, do you think you're better than we are? Why don't you just get off your high horse and come and die like everybody else? Be like the crowd. And let me tell you, I'd rather follow follow after one person headed towards life than 10 million heading for death, no matter how unpopular that makes me. However those 10 million want to portray me and make fun of me, go for it. They can call me whatever they want, but one thing they'll never be able to call me is dead. So you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. And so, choose your friends wisely. 1 Corinthians 15.33, Paul says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And he goes on, Nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. Again, don't follow the crowd. Even if you're the only one on earth that's willing to speak the truth, speak it. To go along with the crowd and the giving of false testimony, God's going to hold you accountable for that. Verse 3, you shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. Now, God loves the poor. God protects the poor and, and the powerless. But poor, you know, being poor doesn't make you immune to what is true any more than being rich does. And the idea is that it's the facts of a case and the principles of justice that are to decide the outcome of any dispute, not social stature. In these first three verses, you know, it applies to all aspects of life. But again, the context is in that of a legal proceeding or a a court of law. And what's being communicated here is that a believer... A child of God is to be trusted and to have the kind of reputation that, that no matter what's at stake for you personally, no matter what's at stake for anyone else, regardless of the consequences, when you are, are summoned as a witness, the world ought to know that they are going to get the truth from a child of God. And what's interesting and sad at the same time is that our judicial system in America, which was founded on biblical Judeo-Christian values. You know the three uh, branches of our government? The legislative branch, the, the executive branch, the judicial branch? Listen to me going ripping that stuff off like my American history. I... Anyway, the three branches of our government taken right from the Bible, taken right from Scripture. Founded on Judeo-Christian values in the Bible. Today it's been turned upside down. Because if you get a summons for jury duty, and this has happened for me before, if during the interview process you relate to them that you are a blood-bought, born-again, evangelical Christian who believes that the Bible is inerrant and that it is the standard by which all men should be judged, there's the good odds you're going to get dismissed from that jury duty. Because they just don't want that kind of influence anymore. Sad. Because, again, a child of God, that you're going to get the truth. 
Verse 4, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. And so even in the law, we see the idea of doing good to even one who is your enemy. Verse 5, if you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, it's, it's, it's trapped under what it was carrying, it's, you know, it's succumbed to the weight. He says, and you would refrain from helping it according to your flesh, my flesh. You know, our first instinct is, hey, listen, you hate me, I'm not helping you. I'm not going to help my enemy, but God says, you shall surely help him with it. And the principle here is very clear. It, it, this is important. It is not how you feel about someone that is to be the determining factor of how you treat them. Your flesh is always going to be like, heck with them. But the principles of justice and law, the principles of love, are to all precedence over our feelings for another person. And so to put it like this, just because someone has done you wrong, what God is saying here, just because someone has done you wrong doesn't excuse you from doing them right. Verse 6, you shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. Again, God protects the poor. They're not to be shown favor because they're poor in regards to establishing what is true, but they're not to be taken advantage of either. It's very common in any particular culture for the poor to be sort of neglected or maybe not to even get a, a fair trial simply because they can't afford adequate counsel. But God says that should not be so. Everyone should get a fair trial based on truth, not a person's bank account. Verse 7, keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous. I don't know anything more innocent than a baby within the, the supposed safety of its mother's womb. And it's interesting here that this, this is being presented by God in the context of a judicial ruling. And today we are seeing the very sanctity of life in the most innocent of all being decided judicially in our country, all the way up to the highest courts in our land, having a hand in, in the murdering of an innocent life. When God said very plainly from a judicial context, you better keep yourself far from these kinds of things. The killing of the innocent. And the, and the consequence, God says, for I will not justify the wicked. Verse 8, he says, and you shall take no bribe. There, there's... there's there's no denying that money is very powerful in our, in our world. The golden rule, of, you know, the world, the golden rule is, is the one with all the gold makes all the rules. But God says money can't play a role in the establishing of truth, in the establishing of uh, justice. You shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. And so even... Those with godly intentions and those who desire nothing, you know, but the truth, the whole truth, you know, so help you God. Even the best of men can be influenced by money, by a bribe. And notice it says you shall take no bribe. It doesn't say that you shall make no bribe. And the reason is because no one can make bribes if no one's taking bribes. Bribe makers can't exist without bribe takers. So you shall take no bribe. Also, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, or better translated, you know the life of a stranger by experience, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Now, any of us, if you travel outside the U.S., I always have this kind of uneasy feeling about being a stranger in a foreign land, because you, you stand out. People notice you. And, and, you know, there are countries that don't give foreigners the same treatment as they do their own citizens and the same respect in regards to the, the law. And you can find yourself in a situation where, you know, you're at the mercy of a, maybe a corrupt legal system. 
But this is God's people, and this is God's land that's being established here. And God says, you treat everyone the same. Foreigners are to be treated just as fairly and with the same amount of respect as everyone else. And now he gets into the the Sabbath laws. And here, um, the law of the, the sabbatical year. He says, verse 10, six years, you shall sow your land and gather in its produce, whether it's olives or almonds uh, or fruit or, or grain. Israel is very, very productive uh, in all of these kinds of things. Uh, and it says you can work the land for six years, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow. And the idea is that, that God's going to give you enough during these six years to last through uh, the seventh year. And imagine, you know, if you were offered that kind of work schedule where you, you, you get a year off with pay every seven years. I mean, I could sign up for that. But the idea is that the land would get a rest, the servants would get a rest, the animals would, you know, that work the land would get a rest, the landowners wouldn't be tempted to just work themselves to a frenzy trying to maximize their profits. It made everyone step back and enjoy rest. And then also equally as important is God says that the poor of your people may eat. And here, here's God looking out for the poor again. God allowed in that seventh year the, the poor people to store up the people that didn't own land. They could store up for themselves and they could work your land and they could have food for their families. From these fields that were, were lying uh, fallow. And notice it wasn't just given to them though. God wasn't establishing a welfare system. They had to work for it harvesting everything that grew out of the land that wasn't planted, everything that grew wild they were entitled to, but they had to work for it. Now, in regards to this sabbatical year, you'd think that of all of the laws that God established with Israel, you'd think that this one would be the one that God's people would have no problem keeping. Where God said, listen, you know, you work hard. It's, it's hard working the land. That's hard work, especially in those days when there were no tractors and, and, and heavy machinery. God says, it's hard work. So as a blessing for your hard work, every seventh year, I want you to take a whole year off with pay. I'll provide enough for you during those six years, to carry you all the way through the seventh. You just rest. You take a a year-long vacation. I'd be like, "Uh, if you insist, I will do this for you, God. But with the greed of man, how long do you think that it took Israel? How long do you think it took them before they stopped obeying this command? They never obeyed it. They would get to that seventh year and recognizing that they had enough now to carry them through the year, uh, the the thought was, man, now I can really get ahead. Now I can make some serious profit. And for 490 years, that's a significant number, But for 490 years, the Jews worked their land to a frenzy. They never, ever gave it a rest. And so they found themselves in a place where they owed the land 70 years of rest. They were indebted to the land 70 years of rest. And so what did God do? God allowed the Babylonians to carry the Jews off into captivity where they remained as slaves in Babylon for guess how long? 70 years until their land was given the rest that it was owed. And listen, people may think, and I've been guilty of this in the past, but people may think that, you know, that God doesn't care uh, they may think that they're getting one over on God or God's not paying attention you know, as they are holding back for themselves what belongs to God. But one way or another, God's going to get His. And I'll promise you, 
It's much better for you than that, that God gets his portion out of your obedience rather than God having to take what belongs to him because of your greediness. Greed gives the impression that you will have more for yourself. It's that, I'm not going to give God that seventh year because now really I can stock up. This I'll just keep this for myself. Gives you the, the, the impression that you will have more for yourself. But in, in reality, it just made them slaves. In reality, it just makes us slaves, being greedy. In addition to that, chasing after money and wealth, commercial Babylon will run you absolutely ragged. It'll, it'll bring about nothing but stress and worry and all sorts of things that contribute uh, to bad health in a human life. Whereas rest, trusting in God, being obedient to God, obeying God's word, it is going to lead to a stress-free, worry-free, completely fulfilled life. In the seventh year, you shall let the land rest and lie fallow, that your poor people may eat, and what they leave, the beast of the field, it says, the animals may eat. God's taking care of everybody. The animals, even the, right down to the smallest sparrow. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and with your olive grove. And then verse 12, he says, Six days you shall do work, and on the seventh day you shall rest. Listen, God loves a hard worker. Don't, don't mistake that. But we must also never forget or ignore the fact that God also loves and demands rest, even as he himself rested on the seventh day. And on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. Every religion in the world is all about working your fingers to the bones, with the exception of Judaism, uh, and maybe some of the cults that actually worship the idea of the Sabbath. But in reality, I like it that God is interested in all the earth continually being refreshed. All the earth recognizing this need for, for rest. The, the, the principle of the Sabbath rest was intended for all of God's creation. For man, for the animals, for the land. Rest is good. But there was also a greater purpose in what that Sabbath rest was communicating. And another sort of law from the heart that we are breaking when we don't obey it. What, what the Sabbath is pointing to for us is that ultimately eternal rest is going to be found in God's Son, Jesus Christ. You look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. So there remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for He, you and I, who has entered His, Jesus' rest, has Himself also ceased from His works as God did from His. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of of the Sabbath laws. He is our rest. In Him, all work on this earth is complete. Verse 13, And in all that I have said to you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods, nor let it be heard from your mouth. In other words, the Sabbath was to be dedicated unto the Lord and not to be dedicated to other uh, false gods or foreign gods. He says, three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. God required Israel to come together three times a year or, or for three different feasts. And God's going to give the, the details regarding the observance of these feasts when we get over to the book of Leviticus. Uh, but here he says, you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. That's the first feast. This is the feast that is associated with the celebrating and the remembering of the Passover. He says, you shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt. And notice he says here, none shall appear before me empty. Now, there are two kinds of people that walk through church doors. Those who walk in and, and, and they look around and they say, how can I be served here today? And then there are those who walk in and say, what can I give of myself today? God says, all are to come ready to give. No one is to come before God empty-handed in regards to serving God and serving others. 
loving God and loving others. There are those who come to church looking only to get something. And then there are those who come, they're prayed up, their hearts are prepared to worship, they're eager and even excited and honored about tithing. They're ready and willing to reach out to someone to be the hands and the feet and the heart of Jesus. And in doing so, they greatly enrich the fellowship. And then ironically, having given of themselves, they leave having gotten way more than those who came only to receive. I love how God always orchestrates these kinds of things in our world. But the first feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, again associated with the Passover. It's celebrated in the spring. And, and Jesus was the fulfillment of this feast, having been crucified during the, the Feast of Passover. He was the Passover lamb and everything that the, uh, the Passover celebration was pointing to. But also being crucified in this, this the way it worked was the, the Feast of Passover sort of like a, and the Feast of Unleavened Breads kind of run together. You'd have the Feast of Passover one day, and then the following seven days would be the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but they're kind of all recognized together during that uh, eight-day period. And so Jesus was also crucified during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is also significant. Leaven was a, a typology of sin. And you remember... Back early in Exodus, when the, when the Jews were coming out of Egypt, they were told you know, during this celebration that they were to remove all of the leaven from their house. During this time, it's where we get the idea of spring cleaning. Uh, but, but they were to remove all of the leaven, which is a symbol of sin, from their house. And Jesus fulfilled this uh, feast as well as He was hanging on the cross. The, the leaven in our lives, the, the sin... Your sins, my sins were being purged as he was hanging on the cross. Our houses were being made clean, uh, figuratively speaking, all of those who would then accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Verse 16, in the, in the next feast, the Feast of Harvest, also known as the, the Feast of First Fruits. It says, the first fruits of your labors which you have sown in the field. This was a feast that was celebrated 50 days after the Passover. And what's interesting is that this feast was fulfilled not only by Jesus because he was the first fruits of the resurrection, but it's during the, the, this, this particular feast, shortly after Jesus' ascension into heaven, it's shortly after this that the day of Pentecost happens where Peter stands up and preaches the gospel and the Holy Spirit comes on the scene like a mighty rushing wind and 3,000 people are saved and brought into the kingdom on that, on that first day of the church, so to speak. That's the day of Pentecost. That's also uh, the, 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 the day of this, this feast of first fruits. And so it's a fulfillment of the, the feast of first fruits as well, the first people getting saved was during this feast. And of course, the fulfillment of the, the Feast of Harvest, as it's also called. And, and, and the harvest is still going on today. Including, you know, that harvest includes many of us in this room, or hopefully all of us. And then the third feast, the Feast of Ingathering at the end of the year. It's also known as the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And it's celebrated in the fall after all of the, the crops have been harvested. As it says, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. Now, this feast has yet to be fulfilled prophetically or symbolically because God's harvest is not yet complete. Some commentators say that, that the feast of ingathering will be fulfilled at the rapture of the church. Others say that it will be fulfilled at the second coming. Uh, either way, it will be fulfilled in the near future. Verse 17, three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God. All the males were required to attend these three annual feasts. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. Again, leaven is a picture of sin. The idea uh, is you, you hear me saying all the time when we take communion, don't come to the Lord's table with dirty hands. I... I 
I remember uh, it's been 25, 30 years ago or whatever in, in, in Tennessee. I don't know if it was a pastor, somebody who was high up in the church they found was the owner of a, an, a, like an adult bookstore, I guess you would say it, that sold pornography. And when, when he was confronted about it, he said, uh, I have no guilt because what I'm doing is I'm taking Satan's money and I'm giving it to God. But, but what an insult to God. God doesn't want you to, 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 to bring your sacrifice uh, to him through uh, or with leavened bread. It says, nor shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. The fat of an animal was considered to be the best part. But if atonement, as you're making a sacrifice, if atonement was to be regarded as a complete work, then the sacrifice had to be wholly offered unto God and it had to be completely consumed by God, not holding back uh, some for yourself. In verse 19, the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Now, you guys all know how much I hate teaching and talking about tithing, and I only do when it comes up uh, in Scripture. But tithing is a principle that has been around since Cain and Abel. A lot of people think, well, you know, tithing's part of the law. We're not under the law anymore. Tithing predates the law. The Holy Spirit confirms also the principle of tithing in, in the book of, of Hebrews chapter 7. And so tithing postdates the law. But then it was also important enough for God to incorporate tithing into the law. And so from the beginning of time until the end of time, until the Lord comes, the giving to God of your first and best fruits. And the Bible gives us, um, you know, the, a tenth as an example not dogmatically, but that's, that's what we see in Scripture. But the giving of your first fruits and best fruits has been mandated by God simply because it's where the rubber meets the road in terms of having your faith being lived out by your actions. Tithing says to God, I trust you with everything I have, God. And the old saying is the last and hardest thing when a person gets saved, the last and hardest thing for that person to surrender to God is their wallet. But as I said before, God's going to get His one way or another. And, and God doesn't need or desire your money. He desires your love demonstrated by your obedience unto His Word. Finishing out verse 19, it says, You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. That verse right there is the very reason that you cannot get a cheeseburger in Israel. They will not serve meat and dairy in the same meal. They serve meat and they serve dairy, but not at the same time, not at the, at the same meal. Now, there are two reasons that God gave this command. First of all, even in an animal, it would be cruel for the mother of you know, like a, 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 the mother of a calf or, or whatever to have to assist in any way in the death of her offspring uh, is just not right. And so even in that, we see the tenderness in, in God's heart. Secondly, the boiling of a young goat in its mother's milk was a Canaanite fertility ritual. And so obviously God wanted Israel to steer clear of any uh, paganistic practices as he's bringing them into the land of Canaan. He didn't want them to be influenced by the, the, the Canaanite gods and the rituals and all. But, but they concluded, you know, the, the rabbis, this is just another example where they take one of God's command and they make it something that God never intended it to be. They concluded that if you were eating a cheeseburger, for example, then the meat in the burger, there's a chance that it, it could have come from the calf of the cow that gave the milk to make the cheese. And so if you ate the meat and the cheese together, then it would boil in your stomach as it was being digested and this would be a violation of God's command. Crazy stuff. And so again, to this day, According to the Jewish diet, eating meat and, and dairy together is not kosher. They serve pizza, and it's good. It's really good because they're really good at making bread. But, but you can't get meat on your pizza because it's got 
cheese on it. You can, get a, you can have a big steak, but you can't have a glass of milk with your steak if you're going to eat uh, kosher. Just another example of how the, the Jewish leaders just take simple commandments and, and, and turn them into a burden upon the people. Beginning in verse 20, God speaks some uh, promises to Israel as, as well as uh, some warnings in regards to the promised land, the land that He has promised them. He says, first of all, before He even sends them, He lets them know, Behold, I send an angel. And notice the word angel is capitalized, at least in my Bible, in the New King James. Behold, I send you an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Now this angel can only be referring to Jesus Christ because of what it says in verse 21 and given the fact that angel is capitalized. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him for he will not pardon your transgressions for my name is in him. And only Jesus has the ability to pardon transgressions or to uh, not pardon transgressions. Only in Jesus is the wonderful name of God. Yahweh, the Father. Yahshua, the Son. And so God says to Israel, just as he says to you and I today, I've made you a promise. I'm going to bring you into a promised land. I've prepared a place for you that if you follow Jesus, He will lead you to it. Not only that, He will meet all of your needs and He will defeat all of your enemies. But if you indeed, verse 22, obey His voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies. You cannot have a better ally than God. If God be for us, who can be against us? And an adversary, it says, to your adversaries. And so very simply, blessing comes with obedience. God's heart and God's desire is that we would obey the voice of Jesus in order that He might bless us, that we might have victory over the things that weigh us down, that we might have victory over the things that keep us in bondage, victory over the things that eat at our very soul. God's like, I, I didn't bring you out of Egypt. I didn't, I didn't save you to leave you in the wilderness. God's desire is to bring you into the fullness of what He has promised. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Now we must, we must not... Forget the fact that this abundant life that is promised to us again is the narrow path. It's the hard way. Because we are surrounded by a world and by an enemy that wants to tear us down, that wants to block that path. But God says, again, words of comfort for my angel Jesus will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Skintites. And I, God says, will cut them off. Stick with me, God says, and I'm going to pick off your enemies one by one. Now here's the warning though. You can't serve two masters. As I said before, God is a great ally, but, but you better not find yourself allied in any way with God's enemy. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly, you shall utterly overthrow them and completely, utterly and completely, underlinable words, break down their sacred pillars." Now, now, as this is not God being cruel in the ordering, of, you know, and basically exterminating this this race of people. God created the Amorites and the Canaanites and and the Jebusites and all, and God loves them as much as He loves anyone else. But by the time that Israel comes out of Egypt and is ready to go in and to claim 
the land that God had promised them, these nations inhabiting Canaan had become about as depraved and as evil and as, as, as morally degraded as they possibly could be. They were very, very uh, sexually immoral people, very much into uh, homosexuality and bestiality. But they're very sexually immoral people. And their mode of birth control, they had birth control back then, their mode of birth control was to take an unwanted baby that was born and sacrifice it to their god, Molech. Literally burn a live baby alive on the altar. Not only that, God had given them 400 years to repent. Remember when God, he's, he told Jacob, you know, you're going to go into Israel, Joseph, and, and you're, you're going to be there. 400, almost 430 years they were in Egypt. Why? He was preparing them. He was growing them sort of, they were sort of in that incubator kind of phase, you know, where God was growing them and maturing them, but also God was giving these inhabitants of the land that Israel was going to possess. He was giving them time to repent. 400 years. But still, they served and worshipped their false gods, which was ultimately their undoing. G. Campbell Morgan says, and I quote, Everything in the life of a man or a nation depends upon the character of his worship. And worshiping anything or anyone other than the true and the living God eventually leads a person or a nation into destruction. Because God has a breaking point. And here with Israel, if God's going to raise up a godly nation and a people who will bring forth the Messiah, then He's going to have to rid the land of anyone that's going to have an evil influence on them. And so the idea is, you know, imagine, imagine uh, you know, taking your children out to the playground and then they're surrounded by rabid dogs. You don't let the rabid dogs live among the children. They have to be destroyed. But again, God didn't do it until He gave them 400 years to repent. So you shall serve the Lord your God and He will bless your bread and your water and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. What a blessing. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. What an awesome, awesome contract, covenant that God is offering to Israel. God promises them supernatural protection, blessings of a, of a supernatural nature. He offers them longevity of days and just a great uh, bountiful blessings as a result of obedience. He says, I will send my fear before you. Again, a supernatural thing that, that, that God promises that he's going to cause a great fear in the hearts of the Canaanites. And sure enough, when Joshua sent two spies to go and scope out Jericho, Rahab the harlot tells them, listen, we've, we've heard about your God and we've heard about all that, that he has done and we are terrified of you people. And it's God who had put that fear upon their hearts in, in, in a fulfillment of this, this promise that he had made through Moses. He says, I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you, meaning they're going to flee. They're going to run in defeat. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. And we find that fulfillment in Joshua chapter 24. Imagine preparing for battle, you know, and you're going over your war plans and all of this, and you see your enemy off in a distance, and all of a sudden you see this black swarm coming toward you, a swarm of, of hornets. And I've never been stung by a hornet, as far as I know, but I've been stung by plenty of bees and, and wasps growing up. Uh, but a hornet sting is much, much worse. A hornet sting, uh, they release more venom per sting than any other uh, stinging insect and then it's a pain that continues to worsen over the next uh, 48 hours or so and so you can imagine an army that's been attacked by hornets first of all you're not going to have to chase them you know they're going to be running away pretty fast on on their own 
And when you do catch them, they're not going to be much in a, uh, in a condition to fight. Uh, and God did that for Israel. Again, you don't want God as an enemy. God says, he says though, continuing in verse 29, I will not drive them out from before you in one year. He's, he's going to do it gradually. God's going to uh, take his time, he says. Speaking of taking his time, we're not getting anywhere near chapter 24 tonight, so you can, you can relax. We just got a few more verses here. <laughs> God's going to take his time. He says, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field become too numerous for you. Beast of the field. There's a lot of interesting looking critters in Israel. We were there, uh, we were in Capernaum, and we were at the house of the Apostle Peter, and uh, we, were, we were doing a Bible study. We were right in the middle of a, of a Bible study there, and all of a sudden there appeared this, this uh, it looked like a gerbil on steroids. It was like this big around, like the size of a, of a, of a, a, a chipmunk or a beaver. Or, or something, not a chipmunk, a, a, a beaver, like a great, like this big. And it, there was a couple of them on the wall over there, and, and not like anything we had ever seen before. And, and somebody said, what is that? Look at that. And the whole group stood up and ran toward, you know, the wall that those, and I'm like with my Bible like this right here. And they're taking pictures and all of this, and then finally everybody kind of moseys back over, and I said, here we are in Israel, in Capernaum, at the house of the Apostle Peter, doing a Bible study, and you guys are taking off after a rat. I said, you're like, you're like a three-year-old who you give a Christmas present to, and he's just enamored with the wrapping paper, you know. Anyway, God says he's not going to drive the enemies of Israel out all at once, uh, because it's not what's best for Israel. It's, it's not what's best for the land. We sometimes get frustrated when God doesn't act as fast as we would like him to or I do we bought that land you know and it was just miraculous how God did it and he orchestrated everything it was just like awesome and and then I'm like what do you mean it's going to take nine months to get a wetlands delineation and all of the 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 surveys and the permits and all that stuff and then another you know year or so to build what do you mean two years to get into a, a new building I wanted to be in there like this summer But God's got his plan, and I'm good with it. It says, little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased. So God's continuing to build them, and you inherit the land. And so at the same time that God is clearing the land of all of the wicked cultures and people, Israel is continuing to multiply in numbers. Uh, they're, they're not big enough to be able to cultivate the land yet, or apparently even to control the wild beasts, the animals. And certainly God could have taken care of that just like that if he wanted to, but what would Israel have learned from that? And thus it is with us. God wants to partner with us in order to bring forth his will in our lives. God wants to partner with us in order to bring about the fullness of his uh, blessings. God doesn't partner with us because he needs our help, though. Simply because he wants to grow us in our walks, both physically and spiritually. And so, he takes his time doing that. Because a lot of times, not only is he using us in the present, but he's preparing us for whatever's next. He's maturing us. Nobody becomes mature spiritually uh, in a year or so of growth. It, it happens over a period of time, little by little, as you grow in your knowledge of the Lord and your faith, knowledge of the Word. You don't get saved and then the same day God call you to go pastor a church. It, it takes some time. But if we're faithful in what He has us doing right now, whatever is next will be bigger and more impactful because we will have the maturity to be able to handle it. God is not an indulgent father who spoils his children, pouring out all of his resources and his blessings before we are ready to receive them. But when his people are ready 
to possess those blessings in faith, uh, then what was promised, God delivers. That's why as, as Christians, we're, we're not only to submit to God's will because it's perfect, but we also understand that God's timing is perfect as well. And God's going to give the boundaries now for the land of Israel. It's a, it's a huge portion of land and one that Israel has never fully possessed. Uh, probably the closest they came was during the, the days of King David or King Solomon. But he says, verse 31, And I will set your boundaries from the Red Sea to the sea, the Mediterranean, Philistia, and from the desert to the river. And we know from other places in Scripture he's referring to the Euphrates River which runs right through the middle of the country of Iraq. And so, if the Jews were to possess all of the land that God has given to them, if you look at the map, according to these boundaries, uh, their land would include, not only Israel, it would include all of the land of Jordan, it would include much of Saudi Arabia and half of Iraq. And there's an important principle here that needs to be learned, talking about God Uh, choosing to partner with us to bring forth His will and His best for our lives, His his blessings. God, God promises and God grants. He lays His blessings out there for us to take. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So God lays the blessing before us, but we still have to lay claim to it. We still have to possess it. In fact, if you don't hear anything else tonight, hear this. God withholds our blessings until we partner with him in faith and obedience. Now, I'm not presenting in any sort of way, you know, a name it and claim it ideology, nor am I communicating that your faith makes God in any way your servant. It's God who decide? Hello, <laughs> Jackie. You sure are popular. <laughs> you get a lot of phone calls. <laughs> Hello. It's God who decides the 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 terms of the the partnership, not us. It's God who decides how He will bless us. But the point is, God wants to bless us immensely he wants to give us the desires of our heart but but much of the how much of the blessing that we actually receive will be directly proportionate to how much of the blessing we claim and possess make sense we're given this example with israel israel has never possessed but a fraction of the land that god has promised them simply because they never stepped their foot down and claimed it It's comical today how the UN, the world, even the US has gotten involved in trying to get Israel to surrender even some parts of the land that they have claimed. We got these tiny little, you know, blips on the map or whatever. They're fighting and arguing, uh, you know, over the Gaza Strip and, and, and the West Bank and all. But what the world doesn't realize is that you are fighting and arguing against God. Because according to God, forget about the Gaza Strip, Uh, all of the land of Jordan belongs to Israel. Half of Iraq, you know. And notice the longer you go not possessing the fullness of God's blessing, the harder it's going to be to then go and claim it. Israel is going to, I have complete faith that Israel is going to one day possess all of the land that God promised them. But now, guess what? It's going to take World War III to do it. Or maybe it won't happen until the millennial reign. And thus it is. The point is, with many Christians, many Christians do not live the kind of joyful, abundant life that the Bible speaks of simply because they have never stepped up and possessed that life. And the longer you live this woe is me kind of Christianity, the harder it's going to be to claim the kind of joy and abundance that a Christian life is meant to produce. And you see supposed Christians walking around. Remember the Flintstones character, Bad Luck Schleprock? I'm dating myself. You know, what do he say all the time? Wowsy, wowsy, woo, woo. (laughs) 
But it makes you wonder, you know, you call yourself a Christian, but just what are you living for? Some people aren't happy unless they're miserable. And then, and then miserable people usually want to make everyone else around them miserable. But God is not the author of, of woe is me Christianity. That's man's doing. God never intended for humans to live less than fulfilling lives. God is not the reason that people live half blessed. People are. Step up and claim the blessing. Step up and claim the joy and the abundant life that God offers to each of us. And by the way, something that he came and paid an enormous price for. It's there for you. All you have to do is possess it. Take it. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. And this is an area where Israel is going to fail miserably. The Canaanites were wicked, adulterous, idol worshippers who had no regard for God or, or for the sanctity of life. They were, they were the perfect picture of everything that the flesh stands for. And the Bible says that we are to make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Galatians says that those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh. The book of Romans says that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So you cannot make a covenant with the flesh. He says, verse 33, they shall not dwell in your land. And here's why. Lest they make you sin against me. Obeying your flesh in any capacity whatsoever. Allowing room for the flesh. Even the, the tiniest little compromise with your flesh is making a covenant with your flesh. And it's a covenant that's going to place a wedge between you and your God. And it's a covenant that's going to rob you of the fullness of God's blessing. It says, for if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Now, Israel ought to be able to sit back and look and say, if the gods of the Canaanites destroyed the Canaanites, then the gods of the Canaanites will surely destroy us as well, especially given the fact that, 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 that God has just warned them of that very thing. God has just warned us of that very thing tonight. Now we aren't, in our culture, we're not tempted to serve or to worship a literal graven image like Molech or uh, Baal or Asherah or, or some of the false gods in, of the inhabitants of Canaan. But that doesn't make our propensity to serve a false god any less likely. Our idols can be Sex, just like it was with the Canaanites. It can be money or fame or power, drugs, alcohol. There are many, many American false gods, just like there was with the Canaanites. Whatever the master passion is in your life, that's your God. That's who you serve. And if your God is not the God, then you're heading for a snare. You're heading for... uh, better put in our culture a landmine that's going to explode and destroy you limb from limb bringing about your destruction so turn to God claim the promise and live let's pray what an awesome God you are what a great protector what a great provider what a great blesser you are how you love to bless and to fellowship those who walk in your statutes and so father i pray that you would search our hearts tonight that you would forgive us of all unrighteousness that you would draw us ever closer unto you that you would help us to walk according to your word and according to the obedience that you desire for each of us help us lord not to cheat ourselves out of your best Help us not to serve any God but you. Help us not to make any uh, provisions or uh, any contracts with our flesh. But help us, Lord, to receive and to come into the fullness of all that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, and I will close.
I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. God bless you.